Hello and welcome to Life Church. If this is your first time here, we would love to connect with you. Directly in the seat in front of you is a connection card. Simply fill it out and drop it in the offering bucket as it passes by. Or you may drop it in our tithe and offering box conveniently located at the entrance of our auditorium. If you would like to stay connected to all the fun events that go on here at Life Church, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to see our latest posts. And as always, welcome to Life Church. Good morning, everybody. Let's all stand up with our hands together.
this dance like the weight has been lifted grace is waiting for you dance like the weight has been lifted grace is waiting for you dance like the weight has been Stepped into time. You lay down your life to save us. You took all our shame on the cross, it was laid. Now you're taking us higher. We go from glory to glory to glory. We'll never be the same. Never be the same. You take us higher and higher and higher. We're forever changed. We're forever changed. You call me your friend. Brought into endless kingdom by the blood. I Made, no longer a slave. Now you're taking us higher. We go from glory to glory to glory. We'll never be the same. We'll never be the same. And you take us higher and higher and higher. And we're forever changed. We're forever changed. Take it. 
still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you've never failed me yet you've never failed You're still, still enough. And keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. Cause your promise lasts. Oh, your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness.
hands before. Let's sing it out this morning. I've seen you move. And I've seen you move. You move the mountains. And I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way when there was no way. And I believe that I'll see you do it again. I've seen you Would you just close your eyes with me this morning? I want you to think back to at least one time where God was faithful to you. Think back. Remember. Remember how you felt before it happened, before his faithfulness came through. Did you find yourself wondering if he had actually show up, if he had actually provide, he had actually get there and do what he promised? And then out of nowhere, the promise became a reality. He was faithful and he showed up. Can you remember how you felt realizing God worked a miracle for you? Then here we are today. Many of us in this room and watching online are in need of a miracle today. We need God to move a mountain. We need him to make a way where there seems to be no way. And sometimes we can feel fresh and new again that, oh my goodness, I don't know if God can do this. But remember what he's done before. And if he's done it before, he can do it today. Amen. All over this room today are story after story after story of God proving his faithfulness. God providing when there was nothing to be had. God supplying, God healing, God delivering, God working a marriage out and making it last, God healing sicknesses and removing tumors and saving souls and, and, and opening doors for jobs. If he could do it for this one over here, he can do it for you over there and he can do it for you back here. So I'm here to tell you, God is faithful. His presence is in this room. Just reach out to him and let him prove his faithfulness to you today. Well, come on, let's don't just patty cake him. He's a good God. Give God some praise in the house this morning. Amen. He is faithful. He is faithful. Amen. So my prayer is we would all leave here different because we have experienced the faithfulness of God. Amen. I want us to go to prayer this morning. In the last 24 hours in our nation, there have been two massive shootings. 
one in Texas, one in Ohio. And if you're not careful, you can fall into the system that will try to make it political. I'm here to tell you this is not a Democrat or Republican problem. This is a devil problem. This is a heart problem. But today, a mom woke up realizing she has to prepare to bury her child. Today, a husband realizes his wife is not alive. Families are devastated because of evil but the scripture tells us and God has told us that if we his people will pray and if we'll seek his face and if we'll turn from our evil ways that he would hear from heaven he'll forgive our sins and he will what heal our land our land needs healing today and so I want us to just go to prayer for those families for those cities would you join me Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we ask right now over these two cities, over these two states, that you would just bring your Holy Spirit to comfort. God, no family should have to deal with what they're dealing with. It is not fair, and it is not right, and there's not words that could really adequately be spoken. But that's where the Spirit takes over where we can. So God, would you supernaturally bring your comfort to these families. Surround them with believers. Surround them with positive words. Surround them, Lord, with grace and mercy. Lord, restore these cities. Let this act of evil turn around and become something amazing in these towns where people turn and run to you. God, over our country, would you bring your protection? God, over our city, over our schools, over our churches, would you protect us? Lord, we know this is a heart issue. So Lord, would you stir us up as believers to reach people like never before? Because if people would encounter you and know you, a lot of what's evil would die off. <laughs> so Jesus, open our eyes to see our community, our country, the way you want us to see it. And we ask Jesus that out of this tragedy, you would bring good some way, somehow. And we thank you in advance for being good. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Can we turn up the lights for me, please? If you are new to our church today, we welcome you to Life Church. There's a guest card in the seat back pocket in front of you. If you'll take a moment and fill that out for us, it just gives us a record of you being here. You can either throw it in the bucket or you can put it in that giving box in between the two exit doors on your way out. Another thing, if you are new to our church and you're wondering how do I pick up my children after service, if they are in the children's department, you will go to this back door and line up and they will dismiss them there. Life Church, let's welcome everybody that's new to our church today. Come on. Now, turn around and greet two or three people. Go ahead, be friendly. Be friendly, smile. Make someone feel welcome today. Real quick, before Pastor Keith takes our offering, I want to give you some announcements, some things you need to know of stuff that's happening in your church. This Wednesday, everybody say this Wednesday is first Wednesday. We are going to be having worship and the word right here together as a church with our youth group, adults, kids will be out back. They're going to be having a big event out back. But I want you to join us. I feel like God's placed a word in my heart and I'm actually going to preach this one. I have not taught at first Wednesday, but there's something special God wants to place in us as we go into our fall semester. August the 14th, we start our small groups. The classes are out here on papers. We need you to sign up so that tomorrow I can get your books ordered. Five love languages, five love languages of children, forgotten God, all about the Holy Spirit, circle maker, all about prayer, crashing the chatterbox, all about shutting down the brain. Anybody need to shut down your brain? 
All right. And then Pastor Keith is going to be teaching a Bible study on the book of Ephesians. So there's all kinds of options. We just need to know which one you want to go to. And August 14th, it's going to come together. We're going to have an awesome time. Our new classrooms, the walls are taped and bedded. They're getting ready to do the uh, spray on them so that way we can texture them and paint them and then put the carpet down. And we're going to be ready for August the 14th. I'm so excited for that. Tomorrow, everybody say tomorrow. 5.30, it's I Love My City. We are going to serve our public schools by painting the crosswalks and the curbs and getting them ready for the first day of school that's coming. How many of you know this is a wonderful way to invest back into our community? It is, it is, it is. But I need your help. I noticed Pewter Ball this morning before first service didn't have anyone signed up under it. So I need 20 volunteers at each school. So look at your neighbor and tell them you've been challenged. Oh, you sinners, you didn't even do it because you don't want to go. Look at your neighbor and tell them you have been challenged. Uh-huh. I know you're sick of painting, but here's the deal. We tell our community, tell us where you need help. This is what they present to us. So we're going to go help. Amen? That was a weak amen. We're going to go help. Amen? Amen. All right, come on, give God a big hand clap. Amen. Pastor Taryn already said, but we're so glad you're here today. Look across the faces of uh, all of you, and I think to myself how fortunate we are to be a part of such a wonderful church. Amen? Amen. We're so glad that you're here, and I just believe God has something special in store for you. Uh, I was not able to be in the first service. I was back in the back, but uh, everyone's telling me that this message is powerful and that God has a special word. How many knows that even that God can even work through a garage sale? How many's ever been to a garage sale? How many's ever thought, God, get me out of this place? Yeah. So I, I, I don't want to go too far into this, but I, God has a word for you today. So open your hearts, receive what God has, and I can promise you, you're going to be blessed by the special word today. Amen. Our ushers are coming. We're going to wait up on you for our Sunday morning tithes and offering, give you an opportunity to give. You give. I know God's going to bless you in a very special, special, special way today. Father, we love you. We're so grateful today for your goodness, for your mercy, for the privilege we have to be in your house. We have already been brought to the very threshold of the throne of God by our praise and worship team this morning. And now as we prepare not only for the word, but to give. We ask, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. Help us to know exactly what you would have us to do today so that we can follow your leading, that we can give accordingly. So, Lord, we ask your blessings on this offering, the gift of the giver, and we ask it in your name. Amen. 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 Awesome things happening in the church. I love it. And most importantly, I love that you guys are a part of it. How many of you know the church is only as good as its members? Those that attend, you make this church great. Amen? Amen. So we're honored that you're here today. We're going to have a good time in the Word. And uh, I believe the Lord's given us something exciting to share. And so I'm excited to share it with you. I'm giving you just a little time so we can pass this bucket. Um, this past Wednesday night, we met at Jeff Lee. We baptized just over 20 people that went public with their faith. How I many you know that's pretty incredible, y'all? Love that. Love it, love it, love it. We had a good time. Everybody had fun, and uh, that's, that's just the way church should be. Uh, August the 14th, once again, our small groups will begin. Also that evening, same time, youth and kids will be having a back-to-school bash in the back while we start our small groups. So that's going on. So you get your first through 12th graders here so that they can enjoy the back-to-school bash. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have uh, all kinds of things going on out there for them. And uh, I can't wait for you all to see the new rooms. They're looking so good. Uh, it's going to be really incredible to have this outlet to to do some teaching in and growing in our faith. Amen? Amen. So, okay, for real, we don't lie in church, right? How many moms and dads are ready for school to start? <laughs> uh, 
I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, no, it's wonderful. And we thank God for our teachers. Amen. 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 Well, are y'all ready to get into the Word of God today? Ten of you. That's awesome. How about the rest of you? Y'all ready to get into the Word of God today? Wonderful. Stand on your feet. Let's do our life confession. Let's get into the Word of God this morning. Say it with authority. Say it with power. Here we go. The life I live is not my own. It is anchored in Christ Jesus who loves me. I choose to accept him whose love accepts me, heals me, and changes me so I can love others. I am alive, and so is God's word. I open my eyes to see, my ears to hear, and my heart to receive. Come on, today is a good day. This is my life confession. Come on, give God a big hand clap this morning. Amen, amen, amen. Give this band, this tech booth, an incredible hand. Come on, don't they do an awesome job? I love it. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much for last week, our last month, really being able to take the month off. I enjoy getting to sit on the front row and just participate with you. It's a good break for me. It's a good break for you because sometimes you need a break from me. And so it's just healthy. But now I'm excited and ready to be back in. We are starting a new series who in here would be honest and say, I love a good garage sale? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, who would be honest and say, I hate garage sales? That's me. I hate garage sales. I mean, you know, we'll put one on. Every spring, you're kind of like, okay, let's do it again. Let's have another one because you're like, we got to get rid of some junk, right? So we have this garage sale, and we set up all these things, things that we spent big money on. We put a dollar on the ticket, and then people come and say, we take a quarter for it. No, it's a dollar, and I know you got a dollar, but anyway, garage sales, they're kind of fun. Maybe you can help me out with this. There's a little saying out there that says, one man's trash is another, <laughs> one man's trash is another man's treasure. Have you ever been at a garage sale and you found something that was there that you thought, my goodness, I can't believe they're selling this. I have been looking for this. And it's a steal of a deal. And surely to God, you're not one of those that goes up and tries to talk them down. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 4. John 4, we're going to pick up reading at verse 5. We're going to go all the way to verse 26. We're going to do a little reading today, but it's an amazing story that we're going to really get to talk about. And then we'll land the plane. Amen? John chapter 4, picking up at verse number 5. And this is what the Bible says. So Jesus came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples have gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. You see, racism was a part of life even then. But it isn't godly. Carrying on. Number 10, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And he told her, go call your husband and come back. Well, I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands. See, y'all didn't know the Bible. I mean, this stuff was like Netflix. You have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. 
And Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you don't know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Verse 25, then the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus looked at her and declared, I who speak to you am he. Yeah. Just as a garage sale has the seller and the buyer, our story has two main characters. Two main characters with an amazing dialogue that's going on. And so we're going to start, first of all, with the woman. The woman in this story is a nameless woman. She's in our text, and she has been taught on, she's been preached on, she has been debated on for thousands of years. The nameless yet labeled Samaritan woman. She was labeled, but she remains nameless in our story. Samaritan, meaning hated by the Jews. Samaritans hated the Jews because of a separation issue in Judah and in Israel when there was some territorial things going on. So some hatred began to brew between these two different nationalities. Many Samaritans had been led off into captivity. And those that had remained behind because they were alone when new inhabitants came into the land, they intermarried with them. And so the Jewish, those of Jewish descent felt as though the Samaritans were not pure Jewish blood. Have you ever been labeled? Have you ever had someone put on you a label? Something they said about you, something they thought about you, something that they just, they just put on you and it just became this label that was attached to your name. Have you ever been thrown to the sidelines of life and discarded because somewhere along the way someone decided your worth? Someone said, you're not worthy to be here. You're not worthy to be a part of who we are or what we do. So you just can go and be out there on your own. It could be a label that very well might represent something you've done. The truth is, you were a part of it. You did do it. You did say it. You did do this. And so because of that, now there's this label attached to you, this label that's describing supposedly who you are and what people will think about you. There are all kinds of labels out there. There's the label of, uh, of, of, you know, just being lazy, not, get, not keeping a job, so you're lazy. There's the label uh, of, of being a, an angry person. you got anger issues. There's the, the label of being depressing. You're just a Debbie Downer all the time. You all ever met one of those? You're negative. You're a negative person. You're just negative in everything. You're, you're a liar. Because you've told some lies. Or you're a thief because you've stolen something. Or, or maybe there's this, you're just broken. You know, you just, you, you're, you don't offer anything good because you're just a broken person. You're broken in your mind, broken in your heart. You're poor. We, we were raised poor. You were raised poor. And you're going to remain poor. There's that, that being pushed on you, that label. Well, you're impure because you've made some bad choices. Well, you're a druggie. You're an alcoholic. You're, you're a cheater. You're unfaithful. All these labels the world tries to put on people. Oh, you're, the, you're a hypocrite. Because people love to post that one, especially upon Christians. But you know what? Hypocrites aren't just limited to the church house. There are hypocrites everywhere you go. There are hypocrites at Walmart. There, there are hypocrites at the restaurant you'll go eat at today. But we'll still eat at that restaurant. We'll forgive those hypocrites. Well, I, I got to go buy toilet paper, so I'll forgive those hypocrites and go to Walmart. But church, mm -mm. don't you dare. Isn't it interesting how labels get put up on us, and we carry these labels around, and we wear them, and we become to act like the things that people tell us and upset over us. We begin to live like that, and we begin to think that's our life. I've heard this story, this passage preached many times. And each time that I've heard this story preached, it has always been from a man's perspective preaching it. 
And a man always tends to dwell on that, well, you've been married five times, and the man at home right now is not even your husband. Let's talk about that. Recently, I was visiting with a friend who read to me from a book, and I would love to read the whole book. It's a book called A Very Good Gospel by Lisa Sharon Harper. And she brought a woman's perspective to this story. You see, the Samaritan woman that we just read about, she chose on purpose to go get water from the well in the middle of the day. Everybody else went early in the morning or late in the evening because it would be cooler. She went in the middle of the day when it was the hottest part of the day, and she did not go because she needed to lose a little carb weight. She wasn't going so she could sweat it out. She went because she didn't want to encounter the Jewish women, but also because she had, in fact, been married five times. She did not want to encounter the experiences, the faces of people she knew from her past. Five different men promised to love this woman. Each one said to her, I will love you until the day we die. I will take care of you. I will provide for you. I will be faithful to you. You will have a home. You will have a family. You will have a place that is yours, and you will never have to worry about it. Now, during this period of time also, men had concubines in an effort to grow their kingdoms or to secure their bloodline, to make sure their family would be able to always be there to carry on the traditions and take care of the land and the things that they had earned and owned. So it's suggested that maybe, just maybe, this woman in particular had had issues conceiving a child. She had had issues being able to conceive a child for her husband, therefore carrying on his bloodline, so she was then forced out of family number one. Family number two, a man says, you know what, I think you're cute, you can come join my family. And so he takes her in only to find out and discover the same issue that was in marriage number one has now followed into marriage number two. I'm preaching now. Did y'all catch that? And so now the same issue is there. This husband said, after he said, I'm going to be with you forever, I'm going to take care of you, then said, you know what, you got to go. You're of no value to me. You are not offering anything for this family. And so she went, and there went number two. Same thing with number three. Same thing with number four. Same thing with number five. All this time, the same scenario keeps unfolding over and over and over, forced to leave, abandoned, rejected, put out of the family, out of the house, out of of what was familiar. Each time this woman ended up wounded and more wounded than the time before. Each time her her feelings and her emotions and her mental capacity is being damaged and being altered and, and, and almost paralyzed into the pain. And so now she is now believing what all these previous people have said about her. She is not worthy. She is not good. She doesn't have anything to offer. She now has become the trash that no one sees the treasure in. So she's scarred by real life situations. She's plagued with these things. Then another guy shows up and says, hey, you want to go out? And she's like, okay, whatever. And so they go out and he's like, hey, we need some water. I know where the well is. She grabs her bucket and she's headed to the well in the middle of the day, of course. The house needed water. She purposely did not go early to avoid the Jewish ladies, but also to avoid the other wives of the five previous homes that she had lived in, she had ate dinner with, she had fellowshiped with, she had held their babies, she had loved their children, she had helped do their laundry, and then she got kicked out. She did not want to be around all the memories and all the faces that represented the pain and represented the hurt and represented the, 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 the issues at hand. And, you know, I couldn't help but think we kind of do the same thing in our lives today. 
we get hurt by life and we get rejected by people and we have labels thrown upon us. And when we come around the people that spoke those things, we tend to do this number. We duck our head, we hide, we go down a different aisle, we turn down a different street, we, we unfriend them on social media, we block them so that we don't have to be around them. And all in an effort to try to save face and try to guard our emotions from getting wounded all over again. This woman, much like sometimes we do, surely felt rejection. She, she most likely felt humiliation. She was lonely. She was sad. She felt not good enough. She was broken. But Jesus showed up. <laughs> I love it when he comes on the scene. Because anytime Jesus shows up into any situation, he always leaves it better than the way he found it. He always does something to turn a situation around and make it better. God Almighty, he delivered the commandments, the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. The very law that would condemn this woman because of her past, because of her issues, now is standing face to face with her in the flesh, eye to eye, talking to her around a water well. Isn't it cool to think Jesus wanted to come and change what could condemn us in order that we could live? So we see Jesus now steps on the scene. Jesus taught in Matthew 5, verse 17. He said, don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. Another translation says, I came to complete it. Jesus took up the law upon himself with all the condemnation that would be upon you and I for our wrongs, and he wore it, he carried it, so that you and I would not have to carry it, and we could actually begin to live free from the things that should hold us back forever. John chapter 1, verse 17 the Bible says the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. God Almighty set a date for this precious soul at this water well through his son Jesus. Where the law condemned her, grace and truth now sat looking her in the face, having a conversation. One that would forever change her life. And I just kind of think, could it be that God ordained for you to be in this service at this time to have a date with you? So that he could sit face to face with you and say, I know the labels that have been put on you. I know what's condemning you. I know what's making you feel less than I know everywhere anybody has ever said that you are now trash. You are no longer worthy. You are not to be in this circle. You are not allowed to be a part of this. I know it all. And I am here to tell you I'm taking care of that very thing somebody has put upon you because where they see trash, I now see inside of you a treasure. This reminds me of the story in Genesis where Abraham was concerned for his son Isaac to find a good wife. And all the parents said, amen. Oh, we're just raising our kids to grow up and have their own families. Lord, help them. Families are hard. Marriage is not easy. You bring your family experiences. She brings her family experiences. You slap them together and you try to... Fight out who's right. When in all actuality, all of our raisings were just whacked out, and we got to find out what was good from each one and create our own good together. <laughs> all moms and dads did was try their best. But even at trying our best, we still fail. So you got to pick up and do your thing. I don't know who that was for, but that's for you. But anyway, so here we go. Abraham's concerned for Isaac. He sends a servant out into Canaan, to his homeland, and, and to go and find a new wife for his son. 
And so the servant said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go out, and I'm going to sit by the well, and whoever, the servant girls, come up to me, whichever one says, when I ask them for a drink of water, gets me a drink of water and says, but I'll also water your camels as well, that will be the wife that is meant for Isaac. Sure enough, a woman shows up named Rebecca. Rebecca says, hey, I'll bring you some water, and let me go ahead and water your camels as well. He said, you have got a husband at home for you. She said, yippee, took her water bucket, hopped on the camel, and went back and got married. See, that's how true love happens, y'all. Look for it. What did Jesus say to the Samaritan woman? John 4, verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Just like the servant of Abraham asked the servant girl, Will you give me a drink? Jesus is now sitting, New Testament, saying, Hey, will you give me a drink? A question that brought about a marriage in Genesis is the same question Jesus quoted to represent a marriage of this woman's broken, rejected existence being fulfilled by his love and his grace. And why wouldn't he do that for us? What did the prophet Isaiah declare in Isaiah 53? He said he was, Jesus was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low self-esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our sufferings. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But Jesus Christ was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities the punishment that brings us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed we all like sheep have gone astray each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all we have all turned our own way in an effort to avoid eye contact with our past struggles and pains Maybe you're here this morning and you can relate to the woman in our text. You've been rejected. You've been hated on. You've been mistreated. You're struggling with a life situation that you didn't sign up for, and yet it surrounds you every single day. You wake up in the morning, it's there. You go to bed at night, it's telling you good night. And every time you get into a good dream, it shows up in the dream. Why? Because that's exactly how the devil works to steal, kill, and destroy anyone who has purpose in their life. So if you have been under attack, the good news is you you have purpose. If you have been going through some hell, good news is what has been labeled trash is actually a treasure in God's sight. And if you'll just turn it over to him today and you'll allow him to pick it up and take care of it, he can make things new for you. Maybe you feel empty because someone pushed you to the side, but one man's trash becomes another man's treasure. Isaiah 61, verse 1 through 3, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for anybody in this room that is being held captive and a release from the darkness that has been holding you back for the, in prison, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor upon your life and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who are mourning and provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on each and every one of us a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of despair. Bottom line is this, what you walked in hauling behind you is now needing to be laid at Jesus' feet, and when you give it to Jesus, he'll take the pain and he'll give you healing. He'll take what's binding you and and set you free. He'll take the rejection and cover you in love. He'll take the condemnation and give you grace. And if you've ever needed some grace, maybe just maybe, and you've received it in your life, it might be time to just give God one big hand clap because he's good like that. But Jesus said to the woman in John 4, 14, whoever drinks the water, I give them will never thirst again. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. 
In the earlier chapter, just before this encounter with this woman, Jesus declared in John 3, 16 through 17, this is how much God loved the world. He gave his one and only unique son as a gift. So now everyone who believes in him will never perish but experience everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to judge and condemn the world, but to be its savior, and I like this last line, and rescue it. That's good news, y'all. Jesus came to rescue us, to rescue us from the labels, to rescue us from the sidelines we've been put on, to rescue us from all the ways we've been rejected, to rescue us from every lie that has been spoken over us. God Almighty has set this day up and this service up just for you to realize you don't have to live that way any longer. You can be rescued. The woman in our text was rescued that day. She was rescued. By the very one who wrote the law. He now saying, hey, I am the law and I'm here to rescue you. I'm here to take care of you. I'm here to love you where you've been unloved. I'm here to be everything you need me to be. But I can just imagine someone saying, but pastor, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've been involved in. You don't know my story. You're right, I told it. I really, to be honest with you, don't want to know. There's something about mystery that's wonderful. But there is no mystery to God. He knows your story inside and out. He knows every detail you wish you didn't even think about. He knows it. And what's great about him is he doesn't look at it and say lost cause. He looks at it and say potential. He looks at it and says treasure. He looks at it and says that's my son. That's my daughter. And I love them so much, I'm going to do something for them today. So the woman in our text, she was rescued that day, and I'm closing. John 4, 28 through 29, she, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And look what happened. They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Yeah. You being rescued isn't just for you. You being rescued is for everybody that's watching you and has begun to believe the labels you've been projecting about yourself. But the moment you realize, wait a minute, I'm not this lie. I'm not this label. I'm, I'm, I'm God's kid, and I'm going to be rescued today. And we go out and we start telling people how we got rescued. Guess what they think? Well, if it worked for you, it can work for me. And don't you know, there's someone in your family, there's someone in your workplace, there's someone in your neighborhood that needs to know it worked for you because they've just been waiting for someone to prove it to them and show them that this thing of God and His grace and His love is true and it really works and you were the one that they were watching and when you walk in your freedom, all of a sudden they're going to be willing to come out of the town and see the same one that looked you in the eye, look them in the eye and say, I want this Jesus in my life. If he could do it for you, I want him. We believe there will be a day that God the Father will look at his son and say, it's time. Go get my kids. Bring them home. You can call it the rapture. You can call it the second coming. You can call it the blessed hope of the church. Call it whatever you want to call it. Well, pastor, when's it going to happen? Pre, post, mid, whatever. Who cares? Well, that sounds irreligious, maybe. But it really doesn't matter when you get down to what truly matters. This. Because if you're right with Christ, if you've asked him to your heart, and it happens pre, you're going to go. 
Happens mid, you'll go. Happens post, guess what? You'll go. We don't know the date or time, but Jesus will come back for his church. Are you trying to scare us, tearing into salvation? No, because fear tactics don't last and they don't work. But I am telling you this for a point. Look at 2 Peter 3.9. It says, God is restraining himself. He's looking over the, board, the, the edge of heaven into this world. And don't you know what happened in Texas and Ohio breaks his heart. And he wants to call his children home to him where he can keep them safe. But he's restraining himself. Why? On account of you. Because he's holding himself back. Holding back the end. Because he doesn't want anyone lost. He doesn't want anyone left behind. So he's giving everyone space and time to change. Space and time. The woman in our text had space and time at a well. You're at God's table today. You're in his house. The space is here. And the time is now to change and say I'm taking this old label off and I'm going to take on a new name a new life in him your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning if you are here today and you would say Taryn there have been labels put on me I've been rejected. I've been kicked to the side. I can relate to this woman. I know what it feels like to be hated on. I know what it feels like to be kicked out of a group, to lose some friends, to lose family, to be talked about, and to want to avoid them at all costs. I know what it feels like to be labeled all kinds of things that I have done, and people want to label me that. I know what it is, and today... I want to lay down what someone has labeled me as trash and pick up the label that I'm still treasure, that I still have purpose, that I still have a reason for even being alive today. If that's you this morning, you need to lay down a label. You need to lay down something so that you can come eye to eye with Jesus and him say to you, I know your story and I know what you're going through, but I still love you and I still care and I'm here to help you. If that's you this morning, I want you to boldly stick a hand up in the air so I'll know who I'm praying for today and who I'm here to minister to today. Is there anyone at all that be honest and say, Taryn, I've had a label thrown on me that i got to let go of. Come on. Come on. Put it up and down, up and down, up and down. God bless you. God bless you. You can put it right back down. Secondly, if you're here today and you'd say, I don't even know Jesus. I'm not living for him or saved as you call it. Well, let me tell you something. Salvation is as simple as simple. Praying and believing. The Bible says that if you'll believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's how we get saved, right there. And we'll pray it with you. Do you need Jesus? Two people in first service did. And they gave their life to the Lord. Is there anyone here with an uplifted hand that would say, I need Jesus in my heart. I know I need him. There's one, there's two, three, and four. Is there anyone else? And there's five. God bless you. Would you stand with me all over? If you lifted your hand for any reason, yes, I want you to be bold and step out and come to this altar with me so we can pray together. Come on. Any reason. Or you did not, but you want to come. Come. You didn't lift your hand, but you know you need to be down here. Come. Forget lifting hands. If you just need to be here, come. Just don't rush out. Don't mess this time up for someone. Service isn't over yet. The buffet will be there. Come on. Come on. Come on. We're going to say a sinner's prayer together for five hands that went up. But I would like someone to come and stand behind each person. I don't even want to stand it alone. Come on, church. Somebody behind each person. We're going to pray this prayer together. And we're all going to say it because that encourages those that are receiving Christ. Would you pray with me? Say, dear Jesus, 
I believe in you, that you're the Son of God, that you died and rose again. And I invite you into my heart to be my Lord, to be my Savior, to rescue me. I accept your grace. I accept your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give God praise? Five people. That's a heart change right there. That's a heart change. As we go into worship, we're going to pray for these that are down here. I encourage you, just love on Jesus for a few minutes and we'll be dismissed. But let's take this time and let's let God love on us as we love on Him. You unravel me with a melody and you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies until all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear, for I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave You have chosen me, and love has called my name. I've been born again into a family, and your blood flows through.
Doesn't that feel good? I'm no longer a slave to fear. You're not a slave to that label. I am a child of God. Come on, sing it again. I'm no longer. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Why is that? No, no. I am a child. Lord, we thank you that we're your children. And Lord, we thank you that you have us in the palm of your hands. This room is full of your sons and daughters. And you're proud of your sons and daughters. This room is full of your treasure. What the world has tried to trash, you still see as treasure. So Lord, I pray today, we would leave here with a new mindset of who we are in your eyes. And that we would have a blessed week, living our life free from those labels, living our life knowing we're in your hands. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Turn up the lights for me real quick. Wednesday night, we're going to be right here at 7. Help me out by signing up for a small group and for I Love My City tomorrow, 530. We love you guys. Have a blessed week.